Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Steam Power Podcast, episode number 39. Uh, we got a couple new stories this week. I apologize. I've been uh, off air for a little bit, but we're back, and um, we are making progress on the green screen, and I think now I've hit an issue with my bandwidth with my internet service provider, which I think is, as best I can tell, is the reason why everything still looks a little choppy on the visual side, uh, but the audio sounds pretty good, so... Um, we'll work on that. I'll see if there's another higher level of service I can uh, get from them. But um, for now, this will have to do. Um, so let's see here. I think since last week, it's been about two weeks, the uh, the episode from the Engineering Commons podcast that I was on is out. So you can head over to uh, the engineeringcommons.com uh, and check that out. And... Um, Trying to think of anything else really. It's been kind of quiet, not much going on. Um, so yeah, so let's look like that. let's go ahead and uh, jump into some of our stories for this week, and then um, we'll go from there. All right. Uh, first and foremost, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Audible.com. You can uh, head on over to audibletrial.com slash Steam Power Podcasts, and from there you can sign up for a um, free 30-day trial and uh, a free audio book download of your choice. They currently have over 150,000 titles to choose from and are compatible with your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player of choice, and we thank Audible for their sponsorship of the Steam Power Podcast. Okay, so... Let's jump into the stories for this week. First and uh, foremost, um, a couple months back we got a new Federal Communications Commission chairman here in the United States named Tom Wheeler. Um, He came out of the telecom industry but was also said to be um, uh, more, uh, give greater consideration to uh, public, the general public. And um, I missed the story. It's about a week or two, three weeks old now, but I missed the story, and I wanted to cover it because it's something I think is important, uh, especially for people that produce content on the Internet. And basically, there was um, a move afoot to kind of um, uh, do away with or or lessen uh, net neutrality. Um, Everyone knows that right now Comcast is working to buy up Time Warner um, to make a, a, you know, I think it would be somewhere about a third of the U.S. population would get their internet through one company, which um, to me is a bit scary. I'm a free market competition kind of capitalist, and I think the less competition we have, the worse capitalism works. So anyway, so the story goes on to talk about... um, uh, there's a petition online at We the People that people can sign, and basically uh, the FCC and specifically the chairman, Mr. Wheeler, has said that they're not done with net neutrality, and that they are going to go back and uh, take a look over it. Um, and how they'll do that, the rumor is um, by classifying uh, broadband providers as common carrier. Same thing as the telephones. So basically, um, it would take a look at giving the FCC a little more um, oversight into the broadband um, industry, which um, short of there being more competition, which I don't see how that's going to happen naturally. You know, most of us live in, at least here in the United States, um, you have a single (laughs) broadband provider. So, yeah, I would welcome competition as the answer. Uh, I don't see how, though, the companies that are entrenched in these monopolies give up their monopoly. So it's like, what do you do? So to me, the lesser of the two evils is doing nothing, leaving the status quo with the monopolies isn't good. 
government regulation or oversight isn't ideal either, but in this particular instance, um, because the monopolies were given to these companies by government action, I think the only way to get us out of that original rut is to um, is to go down the course that the FCC is pursuing, and I think um, classifying broadband as a common carrier um, is probably the right thing to do. So we'll see. We'll follow this one. It's a, an important one for the future of the Internet and for people that try to make a livelihood on the Internet as well. All right, so let's get into the big story that, that broke over the last two weeks, and it is a talk about uh, gravitational waves and specifically what happened right after the Big Bang. Um, was there a, a period known as uh, hyperinflation or, or specifically hyperinflation? Um, and how would we detect that? And it's been theorized, it's just never been observed. Well, um, that is no longer the case. There is a, uh, a set of experiments, a set of telescopes down in uh, the Antarctic that the South Pole called BICEP, and they have been looking at the cosmic background radiation, looking for um, basically characteristic swirls in the background radiation that would be indicative of um, gravitational waves that should have existed um, and caused the universe to expand rapidly um, in the first trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. In that time, the, the, the universe's volume expanded from a singularity point to a volume that was um, 10 to the 75th power uh, larger. And uh, like I said, they're basically, they were looking for a, um, a polarization in that in that background radiation, specifically what they call B-mode polarization. And um, they have at least um, the group at, the, again, um, the group of researchers down at the Antarctic uh, led by John Kovac, who's an astronomer at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, believes they have done just that. So, um, it's a pretty big story in that it is, um, if, 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 you know, obviously it will be peer-reviewed and it will go through some scrutiny, but the uh, announcements, you know, announcements don't just happen when, you know, I think they probably, I think they discovered this about a year ago, and they've just been going back and checking all their numbers and their math and making sure that what they've seen is really what they've seen in the, so the team that actually did the research is convinced that they are correct. Now they've uh, announced it to the world, and now others will take a look at it. But if it is true, um, then it is the, the first um, empirical data um, of gravitational waves and um, the first empirical evidence that uh, the Big Bang was in fact how the universe came into being. So, pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of articles out there. I just picked out one um, because of the cosmic swirl, the polarization that was caused in the in the uh, cosmic background radiation. Um, I think we may use this for our picture this week. So there you go. Uh, check it out. One step closer to understanding um, how our universe actually began, and I guess also one step closer to uh, the unified theory that links the uh, the quantum with the macro. That um, and then you know the, the forces and how they're all related. The the four fundamental forces. So good stuff. All right. So moving on. Um, we get to a little bit more uh, hands-on, tangible stuff here. Um, flexible circuits. So uh, I've been kind of reading and following this for a while, and um, there's been a, a breakthrough in a type of uh, material known as carbon nanotubes um, to provide the, um, the foundation instead of silicon chips for truly flexible uh, electronics and 
long story short is basically um, in electronics and, and silicon, uh, to make semiconductors and to make silicon actually useful, we have to dope it. So we dope it with different materials to give it different properties. So there, you'll hear things like there's the N-type um, material and there's the P-type material of silicon. So we dope it with phosphorus or boron to give it different characteristics. The way basically how does it respond to when a voltage is applied. And um, a lot of work um, in, in flexible electronics is though we've been able to find ways to get um, our electronics, flexible electronics um, to work with um, a P type material, um, it's been apparently difficult to, to dope it with N type material. Obviously, to make electronics as we know them today, you need both. And a, so, a group of researchers out of Stanford um, believe they have uh, developed a way with carbon filaments to, to add these N type characteristics to electronics and therefore paving the way for um, commercialization. Um, so I won't go into the details. There's, it's a, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a chemical process. It's a materials research. It's a good story, um, but hopefully what this means is that we will, we are uh, getting closer to the day of having really flexible, bendable circuits, um, which is useful. You know, there's obviously the medical aspect of it, but um, I think it would be cool to actually have a, a newspaper. That I could actually roll up, which is, but it's not a paper. It's actually um, a display that refreshes every day with new news, and treat that just like a, a newspaper that we know today. So, cool, cool stuff, uh, and a, a good article to check out. It's from ScienceDaily.com. Actually, I think I got a lot of them from Science Daily this week. Uh, so, keeping on with stretchable, bendable electronics, um, antenna. So, obviously. Uh, talking about the medical aspect of it, anything to do, any sort of sensors inside that get embedded in the body, there needs to be a way to get that data out. And short of installing USB ports into your arm, um, it seems like antennas and um, you know using radio signals to transmit data at, uh, out is probably the best way to go. But of course, the issue is that humans are flexible, bendable for the most part. We, as we get older, it changes a little bit. Um, but you know, antennas have to be sized for the particular um, frequency that they're going to be transmitting on um, to be efficient. And they've also, when you start to embed them, um, they need to be able to move and flex with the human as we as we move around. Uh, so basically, this is, comes out of uh, North Carolina State University, where they've made a breakthrough on stretchable, bendable antennas, um, and they're specifically using a process um, that you take a, um, you basically, you kind of uh, draw an antenna um, with, I think it's like a silver, let's see here. Yeah, silver nanowire, and then they put a, 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 um, a composite material over it, and basically the so you draw out um, uh, you need like kind of like a stencil and a, a, you take silver nanowires, and you draw out a specific pattern for your antenna, and then they pour a liquid polymer over those nano nanowires, and then when the polymer sets, you now have um, an elastic composite material that is the the antenna itself is now embedded in that um, um, polymer. So kind of like um, I guess the best way to think of it would be um, say you so you had a bunch of um, you had some stranded copper wire um, and you uh, you laid it out into a particular shape that you want it. Um, and then you coated it, say, with either a, um, some sort of resin, and uh, it kind of gets affixed in that shape. And now the, um, the wires um, move inside the um, the nanowires move inside of the 
the composite material, so that provides some rigidity and, and, and the flexibility. So, um, pretty cool. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess one day we'll have something embedded inside of me. Um, hopefully, though, we'll. Uh, I'll be. I'm a couple. Maybe I'm a generation or two behind, and and let the uh, the uh, older generations go first on the beta products, and uh, I'll, maybe I'll do version 2.0. Anyway, uh, let's go on. Um, so, speaking of more materials, I'm getting really fascinated with material science. I should go back to school and get a degree in that. Um, so, moving from the electronics, though, world to construction. Um, you know, we we use in construction um, steel, uh, aluminum, which is you know solid materials, um, and a lot of it, and uh, it's, it tends to be heavy, be strong, tends to be heavy. But if you look at the, if you look out into nature, um, things like bones and shells and uh, the honeycombs of bees um, are similarly very strong, um, but they have more of like a, like a, of a honeycomb shape. Um, and so this is um, some research, I believe, out of Japan. Maybe not. It is from, let's see here, the Karls, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. I don't know why I thought this was out of Japan. But basically, they are working on some uh, ceramic polymer composites that they can then arrange in um, uh, honeycomb shapes. And now, um, the individual kind of like, you know, if you imagine a frame, you know, the length of each of those frames is only a few nanometers, but combine them all together, so you still have a um, fairly lightweight, I think they say it's even less dense, it's at the, there's less dense than water. Maybe I read it somewhere else, but basically, um, you re it results in an open pore, they call open pore non-massive structures to carry the loads, um, similar to how wood and bones is nature, uh, made in nature. So, again, a um, couple of the theme that I've done in a couple of these podcasts is, um, you know, looking to mimic um, nature with uh, materials that are not found in nature to give them extra strength. Um, so, you know, you, we, we invent man-made materials that are super strong, but then we arrange them in a way that kind of nature um, organizes and, and creates things. Um, seems to be a nice marriage of two worlds and tends to result in better um, materials. So, and the other neat thing about this particular, um, this particular research um, is that they're using... Uh, 3D laser lithography um, to actually produce the, the construction materials. So um, sort of like how microchips are made, which as an electronics guy I think is neat. Um, you know, using photoresist and then uh, you know hitting it with light and then um, removing certain materials. You can build up uh, not just electronics now, but you can actually build very, very strong um, construction materials. So I think that is that is pretty cool. And let's see here. Last last story is one. Uh, it's a book that has apparently uh, just came out. I have not read it yet, um, but it's called Our Mathematical Universe. And I'm trying to do a couple more stories more on math um, since I tend to ignore that part. Um, and basically, it's from a uh, a gentleman named Max Tegmark. I hope I got that name correct. Um, and his general assertion of the book and the um, um, the author of the blog or the yeah the blog post that's kind of doing a review of the book isn't totally convinced. Um, he's a little bit skeptical, which is good. I think it's good to have skeptical, but um, basically the the meat of the book is that. Um, 
reality is math, and that all mathematical structures are actually real, and that I'll quote this: the internal reality of human perception is merely a pale approximation of the true external reality embodied in one of those mathematical structures. So, basically, everything we see is is a math formula, and our senses are simply interpreting that in a rudimentary way, I guess. Um, I will. Uh, I think I'm going to have to find this book and uh, read it. Maybe I'll wait till it comes out of the library. Um, but uh, again, it's uh, to me, it's a good. It's it's combining, you know, the pure kind of. Um, I don't know. Mathematics to me was always too abstract, um, but tying it to the physics and reality and and understanding of the universe, I think, is always uh, interesting. So, um, if you've read it, or if you read it, uh, if I don't get around to it, uh, let me know how you like it, and um, maybe if I do read it, if I do get a chance to read it here soon, I'll, uh, I'll do a review. Okay, um, alright, and so let's move on real quick. Um, my uh, my product of the week that I just uh, downloaded here the uh, other day I've been playing with and I, I quite like, especially for um, doing quick um, circuits draw-ups and, and doing a quick simulation or uh, especially teaching is a um, iOS and Android, and I downloaded it for Android, um, application called Every Circuit which is a very beautiful um, interactive uh, circuit simulator. So you can drop and drag components, connect them together, and um, then it simulates it. And then the nice thing is that um, it's very intuitive, and all the voltages and currents, all the node, volta all the node voltages, all the loop currents, um, they're automatically displayed at each point. And there's actually not just the value, but if it's a time varying signal, it actually shows you the signal varying in time. It does a little wavelength at each node, um, a waveform at each node. Um, and if there's things like LEDs, the LEDs will actually glow uh, very nicely. And there's an oscilloscope, so you can view it. Um, oops. Let me see here. The other neat thing is uh, the kind of the... Um, the social aspect of it. Oh, and it does digital too. It does both digital and analog. Um, that so when you when you download the app, you create an account, and that actually lets you into every circuit has a repository, an online kind of like a GitHub of circuits that you can then download other people's circuits. Now, <clears throat> for whatever reason, with that said, um, some people have drawn some. Um, have made circuits and arranged them in a ways to make uh, inappropriate looking things. So they've got to do a little work on their. Um, uh, I've, I've never, I've never in a million years thought that it would be um, people would make lewd drawings with uh, resistors, capacitors, and inductors. But hey, what do I know? Um, it's not bad. It's not horrible. There's not many. Um, but it does exist, so just a heads up. Um, free and open societies, you know. But the nice thing is, um, unlike uh, I've used some other circuits, you know, simulators before, you know, they have they have some level of um, tutorials or, or, or built-in circuits to, to help you test. The nice thing about this is that you have a community out there building circuits, so. Um, Chances are, there's probably someone's already created a circuit. If you if you need to go simulate an, an inverting amplifier circuit, there's probably someone's already drawn something similar. If you're in a pinch, um, but again, like to use it and actually come up and draw your own is very simple, very easy. It's a very beautiful app. Um, I really like it, um, and. Uh, I actually recommend it. It's a little bit on the pricier side. I think it's ten bucks. Um, but as anyone who's, um, if you've trying to go out and buy circuit simulation software yourself, 
you know that 10 bucks is relatively cheap compared to the um, hundreds of dollars uh, that you'll spend. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to play around with it to give a, a real review on, you know, is it accurate? Um, you know, I think it's built on P-Spice. Um, but anyway, um, kudos to the, it's from a group called Muse Maze. I had not heard of them, but it's a um, it's a pretty good app, especially at least if you know if you're in the the DIY maker crowd, um, you may not be designing the next iPhone on this thing, but for uh, doing your your weekend warrior projects, I think it'll uh, it'll help a lot. All right, let's go ahead and end that. Okay, so um, for this week. Uh, Wanted to do a little discussion on. Um, actually, I was torn. I wasn't. We're going to discuss things like um, uh, if you're an engineering major, undergraduate, uh, getting involved with um, extracurricular activities. If you've got an IEEE student um, uh, student organization there, or uh, ASME for the mechanical engineers, I would assume there's a chemical engineering equivalent. But um, in either case, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the value of getting involved with uh, activities and uh, some things that I did as an undergraduate. Um, and that goes basically, it kind of goes into this whole rant that I've done um, throughout these series of podcasts, and that is um, bridging the gap between the academic experience and the hands-on real-world engineering experience. So, um, if you growing up, you know, if you didn't have a parent that was uh, either an engineer or a technician or someone that had, you know, stuff at home, if you didn't touch a soldering iron while you were at, uh, you know, in high school, if you're at home, um, if you never touched a multimeter. Um, you can, at least in my experience, get through um, college with only touching those kind of things uh, maybe once or twice. I think, you know, looking back at my undergraduate experience, I could have gotten through without ever touching a soldering iron had I wanted to. Um, I think we only had maybe one or two lab classes that made us touch, you know, discrete components or, or a breadboard. Um, a lot of it is is academic. It's textbook based learning, um, and I, you know, there's no doubt to be a professional, um, you have to understand the the, the fundamental, the theories. Um, but people don't get hired. Um, you know, people don't keep you employed um, unless you're a professor or a teacher. For just simply knowing the theory, uh, application of the theory is what you're going to get hired to do. And more and more, um, you know, if you're strictly someone who knows design and you only sit in front of the computer, um, that work has already and will probably more so. Um, easy, it's it's very easy to outsource that kind of purely knowledge based. Um, careers or jobs or design functions out out to lower costs parts of the world. Um, so your value comes into, in my opinion, two things. I think it's two things. It could be more, but it's probably two things. So the first is being able to have not just the academic, the brain knowledge, but having practical hands-on skills and abilities in your chosen career field. So if you're an electrical engineer, electronics engineer, get a good depth as an undergraduate, understand both the theories as well as the practical hands-on. And this is again where joining things like your IEEE student chapter um, is very important. If you, you know, some of us, you know, if depending on, on your, your um, your, your situation, you know, I, I, first of all, I always encourage if you, um, between each summer or during the winter breaks or even during the semester if possible, 
do internships and try to do internships in your career field. Um, try to try different industries. So, you know, if you're an electrical engineer, try one year, do one internship in the, maybe the power engineering field. Uh, do the next summer maybe go out into a you know electronics design studio someone that does you know maybe consumer products um, to try to get different experiences now if you can't do that if if for whatever reason say you go to school far out of state and during the summer you've got to come home because you don't have the uh, the, the ability to stay um, you know a lot of times universities are built around areas of that have a lot of, of um, industry or industry builds up um, around schools, but if you live in more remote parts of the country, you go back home, you may not have the ability or chance to work um, in um, your career field, in, in your your academic major. Uh, so then second best is, is go get any job experience, just get, get work experience, build a work ethic, build a reputation, get um, if nothing else, learn how to do your own taxes. Um, learn what it is to get up at 7 a.m. and get yourself to work, and how people write reports, and uh, how to deal with different people. So, if you know, second best is get a job, just any job, if you can't work. Um, but then you come back in the spring and the fall, and you and you balance the fact that you maybe I only did a job that's not related to my career field, but I got job work experience. So how do you make up for that lack of ability to get hands-on experience? Well, that's where the, the student chapters of, of ASME or IEEE come into play. And you know, they have the, the robotics competitions. They've got, um, I think at our school, they had like an all-terrain vehicle building competition. So when you can't get real-world experience, hands-on experience at a job or an internship, you make up for it in these... Um, clubs and these activities, so that's why it's important. So hands-on experience number one to get a job. If you're going to work in the technical STEAM, the STEM fields, get experience one way or the other, either as an intern or in these these different events, these different activities. Um, breadth, depth, build the hands-on with the academic. The second thing is um, to be real successful and to kind of future-proof yourself or outsource-proof yourself. Um, you have to be able to see the bigger picture. So while you may be the world's expert in uh, this new whiz bang, new hickey electronic component, and you're an electrical engineer and that's what you want to do, you've also got to be able to appreciate that today complex systems are built by a multitude of disciplines. So being able to see how you fit into the bigger picture, um, to be a multidisciplinarian, um, is is key. So, with you know, how does that? So, what does that mean, or how does that work? Um, try to and, and robotics is a good example because robotics usually you need um, at least the undergraduate kind of competitions. You need the electrical engineers, you need mechanical engineers, and you need computer programmers, electronics engineers at the minimum to do rudimentary basic um, um, robotics. So that kind of experience, so getting into anything, getting involved with anything that requires you to work with other people outside of your degree, outside of your undergraduate uh, stovepipe. Get out in there and work with the engineers of other disciplines. That's key. Um, so being an electrical engineer who knows a little bit about you know, materials or gears and pulleys or, or mechanical loads um, is more valuable um, than as someone who just knows everything there is about electrical engineering. So get out there and get involved with those. Um, all right, so I think I think that's going to do it. I think I'm going to done ranting there. Um, and we'll go ahead and wrap this week's episode up. So as always, um, follow along at steampowerpodcast.com. There's links to everything from there. Um, you can follow me personally on Twitter, at mbparks. And um, if yeah, if you've got any comments, questions, the the, the best thing uh, is to get on our, our Google Plus uh, community page and post links there and share links there. Uh, that's google.com slash plus Steam Power Podcast. And um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. 
no, I think that's it for this week. Um, you know, and going back and let me just wrap up. You know, the other thing is if you're uh, starting a local makerspace. So if you've got a makerspace in your community, that's another way to get some experience. Uh, don't be afraid to put that stuff on your resume. Um, I'd rather see someone with experience, even if it's at a makerspace kind of competition, than a, a resume that has purely an academic background and no real world experience. So, anyway, I'll wrap it up there. Um, with that, thank you very much for listening. Uh, have a great week, and until next time, stay quirky. <laughs>